Welcome to our Sunday teaching. Uh, happy Lord's Day. It's the day of the week that we set aside to give honor to God, to take a break from our work, to just, uh, you know, to, to hear from Him, to praise Him. So uh, I trust that's what you're doing wherever you are. And uh, hopefully today this teaching will be useful to you. Uh, I'm just going to pray and ask God to be part of this. And, uh, and then we're just going to dive right in. And so let's just do that prayer. Lord, thank you so much for your word. I pray, God, that this will be a useful teaching, that you'll help us to grow in it. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So today we are going back to the book of Exodus. Uh, as if you've been following the channel at all, you'll know that we've been working our way through a couple of different books of the Bible, and every time we just come back to one of them, we just pick up where we left off, and we just read a little more and see what God is teaching us out of it. So uh, the last time we were in Exodus, we were going through the story of how Moses had been sent by God to the the, uh, pe the Hebrew people, and they were they were being held in slaves in Egypt, and so he had been sent by God to tell the Pharaoh of Egypt to let them all go, that they had to, to go to serve to serve him. And uh, the Pharaoh was re completely resistant and saying no to God. He, he was very arrogant and was elevating himself. And, you know, I'm in charge. This is mine, I'm the God of Egypt and, and that kind of thing. And so he resisted God and would, refused. And so then the, fl the famous plagues of Egypt is what we've been working through. Each of the plagues that God brought on, the, on Egypt to, you know, to nudge Pharaoh toward giving, giving them, letting the people go. But of course, Pharaoh hardened his heart and God knew he would, but he hardened his heart each time. And every time a plague would come, he'd be like, okay, okay. And, and, uh, and God would remove the plague, but then Pharaoh would not let the people go. <clears throat> and so we've been working our way through that. And here in chapter nine, we're getting toward the end of the plagues. Not the last one yet. There's still, still three more after this. Um, but we're just going to deal with this one today, and it's in Exodus chapter 9, verse 18 to 35. So I'm going to read the whole text, uh, but there's a couple of verses in there I'm going to just really highlight. And so let's, uh, let's read it. So uh, it says, Behold, about this time tomorrow I will send a very heavy hail, such as has not been seen in Egypt from the day it was founded until now. Now therefore send, bring your livestock and whatever you have in the field to safety. Every man and beast that is found in the field and is not brought home when the hail comes down on them will die. The one among the servants of Pharaoh who feared the word of the Lord made his servants and his livestock flee into the houses. But he who paid no regard to the word of the Lord left his servants and his livestock in the field. Now the Lord said to Moses, Stretch out your hand toward the sky that hail may fall on all the land of Egypt, on man and on beast and on every plant of the field, throughout the land of Egypt. Moses stretched out his staff toward the sky, and the Lord sent thunder and hail, and fire ran down to the earth, and the Lord rained hail on the land of Egypt. So there was hail, and fire flashing continually in the midst of the hail, very severe, such as had not been in all the land of Egypt since it became a nation. The hail struck all that was in the field through all the land of Egypt, both man and beast, the hail also struck every plant of the field and shattered every tree of the field. Only the land of Goshen, where the sons of Israel were, there was no hail. Then Pharaoh sent for Moses and Aaron and said to them, I have sinned this time. The Lord is the righteous one, and I and my people are the wicked ones. Make supplication to the Lord, for there has been enough of God's thunder and hail. And I will let you go, and you shall no longer stay, or, or stay no longer. Moses said to him, As soon as I go out to the, uh, of the city, I will spread out my hands to the Lord. The thunder will cease, and there will be hail no longer, that you may know that the earth is the Lord's. But as for you and your servants, I know that you do not yet fear the Lord God. Now the flax and the barley were ruined, for the barley was in ear and the flax was in bud. But the wheat and the spelts were not ruined, for they ripened late. So Moses went out of the city from Pharaoh and spread out his hands to the Lord and the thunder and the hail cease. The rain no longer poured on the earth. But when Pharaoh saw that the rain and hail and thunder had ceased, he sinned again and hardened his heart, he and his servants. Pharaoh's heart was hardened and he did not let the sons of Israel go, just as the Lord spoken through Moses. So it's a bit of a long text, but just to just to give the idea, if if you didn't catch it in the reading, 
he says no again. Pharaoh, God through Moses says to Pharaoh, let them go. You're going to let these people go or I'm going to bring another plague on you. And it'll be a very severe. Now, this is this plague is, is uh, different than the ones that preceded it in that it's it's highlighted as this will be a severe plague. This will be like you've never seen before or your ancestors have never seen before. This will be really harsh. Um, so heavy warning here. And uh, Pharaoh is like, no, I'm not going to do this. And so he refuses. And so God sends Moses out and he raises his hands and God does what he said. And the hail comes and it's fierce. And and, uh, and then it talks about how just, you know anybody who happened to be still out in the field gets caught in this. They were killed. And the, all of the... All of those plants and those trees in the field were all killed. All those plants. And so it highlights, uh, the reason it highlights certain crops. It says these crops were ruined because they were in, they were becoming ripe. But these other crops weren't ruined. is Because it's actually part of the story. When we think about why did Pharaoh, once again, why did he not follow through? Like he said, I'm, I was wrong. And he, he says, I'll let them go. But he doesn't follow through. Why didn't he follow through? Well, part of the reasoning would be that, when he when he was out of this this distress, when the hail stopped, he was out of the distress and took assessment of the land. It would have been like, well, look, all this grain was ruined and stuff, but I still have other grain, right? And so his heart would have been stirred by this, like, well, there's other grain. This this grain was still ripening. It wasn't ruined by the hail, so maybe it's not as bad as it seemed, right? And you can almost hear the rationalization going on in Pharaoh's heart. He's like, well, the hail's over. I still got crop coming, so no, I'm not letting them go. And he, he doesn't truly repent. Um, so that's that's the story, and that's what we're going to look at. And I, I want to just take a few minutes and talk about this idea today of what is repentance. What is repentance all about? Repentance is a very important concept in the Bible because um, we as humans will discover in our lives that we are in need of doing it. it repentance is really how you come back into good relationship with people. What happens in our lives is we do some, we will do things to one another, or with with regard to God, we will do things or, or think certain ways or be certain ways, um, and it will be wrong and harmful to our relationship in some way. It'll be a sin, right, to to break or or trespass or to to do something that misses the right spot. And you end up in the wrong spot. And sometimes this can be by accident. We will find ourselves accidentally in places where, like, I, I, sorry, I blew it. I shouldn't have done this, and I need to, I need to own up to that and repent, right, and say I'm, I'm sorry and apologize. Sometimes it's just an accidental thing. Other times it's very deliberate. We will find ourselves in a misstep with other people in our life. That's not really a misstep so much as it's like it was just simply wrong. I shouldn't have done it. I did it. I shouldn't have, and I really have no excuse. I did it. And the repentance thing is. When we come to realize how we have we've fallen into a wrong place, that we we want to turn that around. We want to change that and turn it around. And that repentance piece is what it is. It's different than reconciliation. Reconciliation is the act of making things right again. But repentance is the realization of the need to reconcile. And so with God in particular, it's really important because... God, the creator of the whole universe and the maker of everything, when we fall out of step with him, we fall into sin with him, it's lethal in its nature. He's God. And so it's really important that we come to a place with God where we're willing and able to say, I repent, I turn from my mistake. So in short, like, like repentance is basically the ability to say, I am wrong. That's extremely hard to do. It's amazing how hard humans find saying the words, I'm wrong. I was wrong. I am wrong. I did wrong. Uh, it's, it's to identify a fact that we all hate to identify. Our pride sticks up and, and gets in the way and stops us. And it's like, no, I don't want to have to admit that I was wrong. And some people are so stubborn in this. Their hearts become really rigid and think, I will not ever admit. Even if I know I'm wrong, I'm never going to admit it. And some people are like that. You know, and uh, and repentance is about being able to actually say, no, I did wrong. It's so important to the to the repairing of a relationship. It's so important to coming back to God and being in a right place with God is the ability to identify and state, I am 
wrong or I have done wrong. <clears throat> a lot of people like to, to, to talk about bringing people to God and they like to talk it only in the ways of like, God, I accept your love or God, I accept your blessing or God, I accept heaven. And, and we often fail to tell people, you know, coming to God is not just about accepting what he offers. In fact, you really can't even get there until you're willing to accept the fact that you're in the wrong and that God is in the right. And I have been wrong at least about not being right with you and uh, and being able to make that des- that decision. So then repentance isn't just simply identifying that you're wrong. It is more than that, but that's a big part of it. Repentance is also the act of, since I'm wrong, I'm going to now do what's right. I'm going to turn from my wrong place to a new place. And that may be something like, the way I thought about something, right? I was wrong to think this. I'm going to switch now and I'm not going to think that anymore. I'm going to think differently. Or maybe an action. I was wrong to have done this. I'm not going to do that again. I'm going to now do the right thing instead. And so repentance is to turn away from the wrong to do as best you can the right. And uh, and that's really, really important in, in, well, in our relationship, especially with God. Um, and repentance is, is what we're called to throughout the scriptures. We're called to repent. And if we won't repent, then we die in our sin. On a spiritual level, we die in our sin and are lost forever because we refuse to repent. Repentance is a part of, of salvation. It just is. And so that's the idea. And so here with Pharaoh, is this is the idea. It's like, Pharaoh, you're in the wrong. And in many, many ways you're in the wrong, but you're in the wrong. God's giving you a command, and the right thing to do is obey God's command, but you're resisting God's command. You're in the wrong there. You're in the wrong from the beginning because of how you oppressed his people. Um, but but this is the thing. And so for Pharaoh to hear the command of God, let them go, and to refuse and say, I will not do that. I will not admit that you have power over me i will not admit that you are god and i'm not i will not admit that you're the lord of the earth i will not admit that the earth is yours as one of the one of our verses one of the sentences said there i will not admit this i will not admit right there's a refusal there and then and then god's like well i'm going to bring this judgment on you i'm going to bring hail on you um now it's interesting because in this story after the hail comes and causes such devastation there is a, a point in the story where it, it sounds like Pharaoh repents. He comes, he comes, he calls uh, Moses to his, his throne room or whatever, and, and Moses comes and he's like, this time I have sinned. Um, the Lord is the righteous one. Me and my people are not the righteous ones. Uh, you, know, bes- you know, beseech the Lord for me that he'll take away the hail and I'll let you go. And it, that sounds like a repentance. It really does. It's like he's admitting he's wrong. He's, he's saying that God was in the right. He's saying he's going to take a new action. Um, there's something that sounds very much like repentance here. And what I want to kind of focus on today was actually the idea of false repentance. I just had to describe what repentance was first. But, but really, I want to just think about for a minute, what's this false repentance thing? How do we know that? Like, that's what this was. Pharaoh was not really repenting. It looks, it really looks like he is. And a lot of times in our lives, in our relationships with people, we'll repent, we'll repent, we'll apologize, or we'll, we'll you know, we'll say, oh, like, like, you know, oh, well, my bad. You know, we'll, we'll make some sort of a statement that sounds like or looks like a repentance of sorts. But then after a short time, we just, we, we see that, no, it wasn't really a repentance occurring at all. Um, we see that in this story by the fact that when Moses hears Pharaoh's repentance, one of the things he says, but he says, I'll, I'll do this. Yes, I will beseech the Lord, whatever. But then he says this sentence of, I know that you do not yet. I know that you do not yet fear the Lord. He, Moses could tell this isn't this isn't a true repentance. You don't yet. We'll, we'll go down this road, but but you don't really fear the Lord yet. This can be, it's seen. And and this this false repentance thing occurs is really What's really happening here is Pharaoh's not so much repenting, saying, and, and really truly saying, I'm in the wrong. I have sinned. This time I have sinned. What he's really doing this time what he's, is he's just basically saying uncle, right? You ever play those games when you're a kid, you know, some sort of an arm wrestle or a, we used to call them finger fights or you'd try and bend the other person's finger or whatever. And, 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 and it was, you'd have these little arguments or little fights, little competitions. And the, the goal was to get the other person to say uncle. And uh, so you exert enough pressure or whatever until the person surrendered, so to speak. And and basically that's what's happening here. Pharaoh isn't really repenting. He's not really thinking he did anything wrong. He's just saying, okay, you got me. 
fine, take away the hail, you know, uncle. <laughs> And, uh, and, and Moses sees this and so he says, I can, I can tell you don't fear the Lord yet. Um, that's false repentance. And it's, it's a really bad thing. It's a really dangerous thing. And whether it be our relationship with God or our relationship with other people, um, we need to learn to not be people so stubborn that we will not repent. And we really have to be careful falling into these false repentant habits false repentance habits where we're not really saying it and uh, and i mentioned a couple of those phrases earlier you know when we say things like oh my bad and we really don't mean anything by that we just like don't get mad at me i i admit it was my bad don't get mad at me and all we really want is to avoid any consequence of our action or our, or our behavior or thoughts or whatever and so we're really just trying to to dismiss the issue and that's exactly what it is it's dismissive it's a way of trying to remove it. Oh, I'm sorry that you were hurt. Just think about that. Are you really sorry? No, not really. <laughs> I am sorry that I hurt you would be more likely what you'd say than I'm sorry that you were hurt. But we do this. We have these false repentances in our relationships and they don't fix things. And it creates actually something worse down the road. Even more so with God. When we come to God and we say, look, I apologize. I'm sorry, but we don't really mean it. We come with a false repentance that's that's just actually increasing the hardness of our own heart and that's really dangerous so what is what is it you may ask what are, what are the signs of false repentance how can i know if i'm being really sincere because you might hear me talk about this and you might have a little bit of fear in you like well i don't want to i don't want to be that kind of person i don't want to come to god with false repentance and and my heart get harder um so what is it that that may help you understand or recognize that you've stiffened your neck as it were you've hardened your heart and you're not really repenting well a couple of those things you can watch for are things like uh when you when you're not really willing to admit that you've sinned uh and this this isn't necessarily obvious right up front you you can say things that sound like you're admitting your sin like think well what pharaoh said here right i've sinned this time the lord is the righteous one um but but think about what he said there. I have sinned this time. This is the seventh plague. He has sinned seven times. And he is not owning up to that. I have sinned this time. I, and seven plagues. And not only seven plagues. But prior to that, there was the whole resistance when Moses first came to the... Before any of the plagues. When he was like, I am not listening to you. And before that, there's the fact that he imprisoned the entire Hebrew people in the first place. And oppressed them with slavery. He's not apologizing, not recognizing that. Or what about when he threw all their children into the Nile and they were killed by crocodiles? No, he's not, none of that. But this time, I've sinned this time. Yeah, what happens in our life when we falsely repent is that we just, we get to a place where we're not really willing to admit, I have done wrong. I am in the wrong. Not just this time, this whole affair, I have been in the wrong. If Pharaoh had truly repented, he would have said, you know what? I am I am the sinner and God is the he is completely right in what in this it would have been more it would have been more and you can go through the motions you can say the words but it has to happen inside in the heart somewhere inside of you you really have to believe you know what I am wrong when we when we find ourselves in relationships with other people and we get into those scenarios where really I should I should repent I have done wrong and yet we find ourselves not really willing to admit that we're in the wrong, wanting to guard ourselves against the person. Maybe the person will feel the person won't forgive us. And so we get we get in a place where we're going to guard ourselves. We're not really going to admit we're wrong. Or what if they take it out on me? Or, but a person who's truly repenting is a person who go, hey, this really was my mistake. I am in the wrong on this. And I'm going to own that. I am in the wrong. And this is important because that's how your mind changes which is what repentance is. It's a changing of the mind, changing of the heart, changing of direction. So you're able to say, I was wrong, so I need to change to be now what is right. And that's why it's so important. And if we won't do that, you're not actually repenting. You're just trying to dismiss a situation that you don't like. Another one of the signs that we're not really repenting is when we make excuses or deflect 
it's 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 just very similar to the first one, but it's just a little further in the understanding of it. We'll we'll make excuses. I was wrong, but you know, I, I, this situation was just this way, or you know, there was this. There was I could hardly help myself, or you know, if you and we come up with all these reasons why. Yes, I was wrong, but I was understandably wrong. Is kind of the idea here, and and. In this case here, it's like Pharaoh saying, I and my people are the wicked ones. <laughs> well, Pharaoh's making all the calls. He's claiming himself to be the God King of Egypt, but he's going to know, I and my people are the wicked ones. It's like, you know, I'm going to normalize this and deflect this a little bit. It wasn't really all on me. It's just us. And and this is kind of what we do when we're not really repenting is we're trying to, we try and find ways to excuse our behavior to sort of like arguing to the other person and saying, you know what? I was in the wrong, but you really don't have any right to judge me for being in the wrong because I have a good excuse. It excuses me from judgment or I have good reason or it's actually somebody else's fault. Maybe it's your fault. You know, I wouldn't have been so grumpy if you hadn't started out, right? And we, we have a reason why my behavior really wasn't that wrong after all, was it? And we make excuses and we deflect and we would find ourselves doing that. It's not true repentance. It's really not. Um, you, know, you, might, you might hear people use the term of backhanded apology, right? I'm, I'm, I'm sorry that you're such an idiot, <laughs> right? Like that's, that's not repentance. That's, you're, you're just, you're, you've just turned it all around. And, and this, this, is the, this is the way we go. When we find ourselves doing that, see, a, per, a person who truly repents doesn't seek to excuse themselves from the culpability of what they've done. They recognize, I was in the wrong. I deserve to be the one to fix the to, to pay the penalty of this i deserve it because i was in the wrong i'm making no excuses it's, there's no excuse for this i have reasons but i do not have excuses and so i did it for this reason but that was wrong i shouldn't have and you don't deflect it away in the garden of eden that's what adam and eve did oh i i, I ate of the fruit but it was really because it was the woman you gave me she did it and you know blaming god and the woman at the same time and it's like no, you sinned, and uh, and that's what we do, and that's that's very bad. It's 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 false repentance. Uh, another thing we will do is we'll try and bargain. If you find yourself trying to bargain your way out of it, trying to find a way to not really have to take responsibility for what you've done, right? Well, I know I did wrong, but you know, if it's just kind of one of those things, and you know, I don't, it, and and then you try and come up with a, a way to start bargaining. If you'll do this, I'll I'll do that, right? You know, it's like the guy who crashes into your car and he's like, you know, well, you know, I, I yeah, I, I ran into you. But, you know, if you'll just if you'll just wave off, thing, I'll, I'll give you a few hundred bucks here and we'll just kind of we'll, I'll bargain this out. I'll give you a little bit of money now. We'll keep the insurance out of it. And it's like, you know, we try to find a way to to reduce the cost of being wrong by bargaining away with the other person in some way uh, so that you can not have to pay the consequences of what you did. And that's not true repentance. That's you recognizing you've been caught and just wanting the consequences to go away. And that's very common with people with addictions, for instance. Very common for people who keep habitually doing something. They often will find that their lives start to fall apart and they'll get really desperate and they'll sound repentant. But what they really are saying is, I, I don't want to change. I just don't want to suffer. Right? I don't want the consequences. So let me bargain this away, God. God, if you will just take away the consequence of this thing, then I'll, I'll go to church from now on. And what they're not willing to do is say, I will stop doing the thing. I will give it up 100% gone, irrevocably and irre irre irrecoverably gone. And you'll find this in people that, that they're not really willing to do that. They're not willing to give away the access to the sin and so they bargain and try and find another way to get the consequence going. That's what Pharaoh was doing here, right? He says, to, he says to Moses, go make supplication and take away the hail, and then I will, you know, and I will let your people go. There's the bargain. If you'll take away the hail, I'll let the people go. And well, Moses goes out and takes away the hail, and guess what? Pharaoh's heart was hardened and he didn't let the people go because he wasn't actually repenting. He wasn't really admitting his error, his fault, and he was going to bargain his way out of it. And this is what we do. And it's, 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 a, it's false repentance, and it hardens our hearts, makes it, makes it even harder to ever repent. It's very dangerous. 
um, the last little piece of this false repentance part, and then I'll say a few other words, but is that sometimes you'll find that you don't actually have sorrow. And this is one of the, another one of the one of the clues that um, that you maybe have false repentance is that you don't actually have sorrow about the harm you did to the other person. Your sorrow is actually about how it reflects on you. And a lot of people that fall into false repentance, they're really just sad about themselves. And it can even sound like repentance, right? Oh, I'm, I'm such an idiot. I can't believe I, I can't believe I did this. I'm, I'm so sorry. I'm such an idiot. And what they're sorry about is that they are such an idiot, not about the harm they did to you, right? Did you follow that? Rewind the video if you have to and listen to that again. But that, that's false repentance. When a person's sorrow is about what it means about them, right? Oh, I'm such an awful person. Uh, it's a way of like saying, I don't like that I'm such an awful person. That's what I feel bad about. I wish I wasn't an awful person. And they don't have sorrow about, I was awful to you. How that must have made you feel. See, when we get to the place of going, oh, the harm I did to that person. That can create a sorrow in us that's a repentant sorrow. I am sorry that I hurt you. And I want to make that right. I want to undo that hurt if I can. And if it's beyond my ability to do it, I'm, that makes me sad. I'm sad that I can't undo the harm I did because of the harm I did to you rather than of what that means about me. Right? False repentance is always self-focused. The sorrow is always self-focused. But real repentance is always focused on well what I what I've done wrong and how I've harmed the other and I wish I could make this right somehow. And it usually motivates a change in what you do so that you can try and make it right. That's you know, how that's how repentance is usually expressed through an effort to make it right for them, even at cost to yourself. That's true repentance. So here's the thing about all this. This is really important to understand these things about false repentance so that you can kind of examine yourself but here's the thing that, that kind of wraps it all up. And this is this is very much evident in the story of Pharaoh. If you go through all these chapters of, of Exodus and read the whole story, you'll see this recurring theme of the hard heart. Pharaoh's heart was hardened. First he hardened it himself, and then after a while God started hardening it because he was unrepentant. The hard heart does not repent. It may look like it sometimes. It may try to convince others that it has sometimes, but the hard heart does not repent it never repents why because it's hard it's resistance to change and repentance is change it's a change of mind it's a change of behavior it's a change of intentions it's a change of heart and a hard heart doesn't change it's resistant to change the hard heart is the heart that doesn't want to change it stays where it is it doesn't want to be affected and impacted it doesn't want to feel bad and resist that and will not allow it. In fact, it'll be hostile to anyone who ever dare can suggest that it needs to change or that there is wrong. And, and you know, a little spoiler here, we'll see in another sermon in the future, but a couple plagues from now, Pharaoh gets so angry with Moses, he threatens to kill him if he ever shows up again. Because that's the buildup of the hard heart. It's not, I, I'm sorry. It's, it's, you dare tell me I'm in the wrong? And it gets increasingly hostile. And, uh, and people with hard hearts that are unwilling to change will become enemies with anyone who ever suggests that they did wrong. That's where it eventually goes. Hard hearts don't repent. Pharaoh was told, let my people go. That's what he was told. Let them go. They, you've been oppressing them. Let them go. You, they're my people. Let them go. I'm God. Let them go. And to all of those things, Pharaoh said, No. I, he, Pharaoh's response was, I am the God King. I, these are my people. They're my, my property. And no, I have not been oppressing them. I'm the King. I have the right. And he had a very arrogant and, and lofty opinion of himself that he was resistant to God's, um, God's commands or God's interaction with him. And so he was unrepentant. Now, I want to ask you, in your life, with regard to God in particular, but you can apply this to others as well, but with regard to God, what are the things in your life that you might have that God is saying to you, let that go. You, you have this thing in the wrong place. Let it go. It can be, in, in Pharaoh's case, it was the people of, of Israel, but, but what is it in your case? What are the things in your life, these pieces of your life that you... you, you you're being confronted by God in this way or that way. And he's saying, this is, this is wrong. 
let it go. Get stop holding on to this. Let it go. Right? Whatever it may be. Maybe it's habit. Maybe it's an attitude. Maybe it's something you love more than you love God. And that's wrong. Um, who knows? Whatever it is, there could be things in your life, different things, different behaviors, different thoughts that you shouldn't have. And there are things you're holding on to. And maybe in your life, God has come to you and he sent a, a Moses, a Moses into your life, whether it be a person or a message from the Bible or whatever, to say to you, this is wrong. You need to, you need to give this up and make me God. And uh, not that you make him, he is God, but that you recognize that he is God. And uh, what are those things you're holding on to? What are the things in your life that you've made off limits to God? Right? That, that he's not allowed to tell you anything with this thing in your life, this part of your life. No, God, you're, no admittance for you here or there. There's little pieces of your life you're, you've decided are restricted from him. And you've decided that that's the way I am and that's the way I'm going to be. And I, I, won't even, I won't even listen to the option f that, that God might disagree with this or disapprove of this. You know, or what are the areas of your life you've given yourself permission to be a certain way? You've decided you have a right to this or that. So how dare God ever tell you you can or cannot have it? You know, these kinds of questions are important questions because they might highlight for you places in your life where your heart is hard, right? It's places in your life where you're saying, I will not allow change here. I won't change my mind on this. God doesn't have right to this. I'm holding on to it. It's off limits to God. I've given myself a right here and I'm going to hold on to it. Those are the areas of your life where you're going to find your heart is hard, your heart is hard and un, unmalleable, unwilling to repent, to recognize where you might be wrong and God is right. And uh, and the thing about those areas is they're very dangerous because they 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 will be challenged. The hail will come. God will eventually, he'll ask you to give it up. He'll give you opportunity to give it up. He'll poke you and prod you and the, the plagues will grow and the hail will come, figuratively speaking. The hail will, well, maybe literally in some cases, but it's certainly at least figuratively, the hail will come. And uh, the question is, in those areas of your life, if you're not willing to be changed, you will harden your heart to these things. And you may even do false repentance, but you'll harden your heart to these things. And eventually it will become so unmovable that you cannot be changed and repentance is impossible for you and that's not a good place so you might be thinking, well i don't want that so how do i have a soft heart what do i got to do to have a soft heart and the answer is surprisingly simple but it's ask for one it's just ask god i was always inspired by king david's repentance psalm in psalm 51 where he i've loved the psalm because it's such a, a wonderful demonstration of a repentant heart where he says in the, um, a whole lot of things, read it, Psalm 51. But he comes to this one point and he says, God, create in me a clean heart. He asks God to do the work. Renew a right spirit within me. Ask God to do the work. He recognizes that his heart is bad. And, in, and part of that is recognizing that his heart might be hard. So it's God, create in me a new heart. Created me a clean heart, renew a right spirit in me. We ask God, and the Bible tells us that the kindness of God leads us to repentance. It leads us to the place where we can repent, where our hearts will be softer. I love how it says in Ezekiel that, that God says, I will take out the heart of stone from your chest and put a heart of flesh in there. Right? The heart that was stony and not able to move, and I'll replace it with a heart that's fleshy and able to be moved. And, and so we ask God. That's the biggest thing is coming to God and asking him, not just asking for forgiveness, but actually asking God, teach me to be repentant. How do I actually change so that my heart will not be hard, but rather I will, I will be able to admit my wrong. I'll be able to move away from it. I'll be able to have godly sorrow for how I've offended you or, or others, as the case may be. And, uh, and that's really what it is. To have a soft heart is to ask for one and to, to sincerely ask for one. Sincerely ask for one. Um, and then yield. As you start to see God give you a soft heart, don't resist. As hard as it is to do, don't resist it and yield to it and say, okay, I will let, I will let God now teach me to obey his commandments. Um, you might be listening to this day and you might struggle with some sort of offense. Maybe there's, there's something you just find yourself, you just keep doing it. You're trying to be a, a more gentle person, but you just keep being, you know, harsh and hard. Or maybe you're trying to be more patient, but you just keep losing your temper. Or maybe you're trying to be more faithful, but you keep letting everyone down. Or Maybe you're trying to be to be noble, but you keep being anything but. You're so dishonorable, or 
whatever. And there's any number of things. Or maybe you keep resisting God in your life and you know that's wrong and it will kill you. And you're just a God, I, I keep resisting you. And I'm so, why do I keep doing this? And you may wonder about the struggle. And maybe you'll hear this sermon today and go, oh, no, maybe I'm a false repenter. And in, in some ways, yes, that is what's happening. But understand this. If, you're, if your pursuit for God is, is genuine, you're like, God, make a soft heart in me. And you need to understand that God is very, very patient. And the struggle isn't your doom. Struggling is different. And God understands your struggle. And he's very patient to those that really love him. I mean love him. I don't mean those that just think well about him. I mean those that really love him. And uh, they value him more than they value themselves. And God is very patient with people who struggle. You know, or, or he's very, very patient with people who fear him. And I, and I mean that have humility enough to say, God, you're greater than me and I want to humble myself. And our humility, God's very, very patient and gracious with people like that. And so don't let the, the fact that you struggle make you feel like you're doomed because you're not. What I'm talking about today is not someone who struggles with a soft heart. I'm talking about a person who actually doesn't struggle because their heart is hard and they resist. And uh, that's the false repentance that's dangerous. But ask the Lord and he'll help you. So let's just close in prayer. I don't know who you are. I'm talking to a camera. I know there's people going to watch this. I don't know who you are, but if your relationship with God is, um, is you see that there's wrong there and you just don't want to own up to it. Please just come to God and repent today. And I'm just going to pray for anyone who hears this to help us to be people of repentant hearts. Penitent hearts as is proper in the right places and times. Um, God, please just do help us with this. Help our hearts to be penitent when we see that we're wrong. To turn around and move back to you. And Lord, to change our minds and change our hearts. And Lord, I pray that you will make our hearts soft so that you can, you can speak to us and your spirit can have your, your way in us pray these things in each person's life and my own as well today. Amen. God bless you. Uh, have a great day. I hope that you're, you just have a wonderful day and um, give God glory today and uh, just, just enjoy his day.